Hi, it's just Joshua with Peterson Electric here today to talk to you about this studio apartment garage that we wired. Um, so the customer brought water here and gas and electric. And the code states in 250, closer to your 122 section or 104, um, that if we have water, we have to bond it, okay? We bonded it with a number six based on 250-122 because we basically have 125 amps coming to the structure. We did a one aught URD. Um, right over to here, we bonded it here as well for the gas. That's 250-104B, it says gas piping. Um, we brought it all the way over to here to go outside. We brought in an SER, number two aluminum, to go upstairs. A couple things that changed in the code for the 2014 for garages. First of all, every car bay you have, so if you have a four car garage to two or a one, you have to have an outlet in front of it that you can actually trickle charge your new electric vehicle. Um, they also want you to separate the outside and the inside circuits from each other. So I simply put a a uh, home run to here, a GFCI in here, that'll trip over to here. This one comes over to here, goes through to the heat tape going for the cold water, then to the garage door opener. The code states that every plug in, a, in 210.8 has to be GFCI, but you cannot have a GFCI not accessible. So it has to be on ground level, not to climb a ladder and get up there to the garage door opener, or climb around some kind of piping to reset it. You have to have an open area in front of you and the same level without a ladder. The other thing, um, the GFCI in this one right here is for the outside power. Well, that's coming over to here and that'll do my floodlights and do my stair lights. So when I label this, I put a really dark line here because I want to know that I'm separating my um, inside circuit from my outside circuit. I also label inside of my switches what the purpose is, a three-way, that I have power on this side or if I have a dead end. I also put my box fill for the inspector to see that 24 number 14, 23 number 14s are allowed, but 20 have been used. Um, so box fill is real important, how many conductors. We put our stacks right here. Um, the other thing that has changed um, in the garages is that they, which they need to change, they have not put in the electric car section um, does that have to be a 120 or a 220 volt for the electric car? Does it have to be 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 amps? I've done the Tesla at 60 amps four wire, like wire in a hot tub. And I've done uh, the Nissan, which is a, a three wire 30 amp, like wiring um, a hot water heater. And then I've done four wires at 40 amps, uh, wiring um, uh, the Chevy Volt. So I've done all the different types. So the code hasn't quite specified yet that, but they did specify that the outside lighting and power are separated. I think they've done that on purpose for detached garages so you don't run 120 amp circuit out there and you have a fridge and a freezer for your elk. Then you've got your electric car, your compressor kicks on because you never turn it off if the air gets low, and then you have the garage door opener and every single time you're losing power. So when you bring out 240 volts to a garage area, you have to be a minimum, I believe it's a 30 amps at 240 volt is what you should bring. You could also step that up though, if you're gonna weld or anything, you should bring maybe 100 to 125 amps. We brought 125 amps to this area with a URD uh, one out underground. I'll show you outside here. This is where that, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me show you this. The, the water pipe right here is where we bonded. This is in 250, 122. Then over here to this gas line right here, we bonded this as well, and that's 250, 104. So we made that continuously through and went up over to here and down to the panel. You do have to keep in mind, because this is a sub feed, you have to separate your grounds and your neutrals, which is your grounded conductor and your grounding conductor. So right here is gonna be considered your grounds or grounding right here, your bare. Here is your neutral tying through to here. This is going to be my sub feed to upstairs, and we do have to use a um, a breaker clip inside of here, which is going to tie this down. Okay. At 100 amps, we're sub feeding upstairs, but we're feeding 125 once we get this pulled in to go to here, and then down here in the garage, these are separated. Now, some people say, why do you put your panels outside? Well. The city of Lafayette, we called the inspector ahead of time and asked them, do you care if a disconnect 
is just right over there. You can turn around, show them. Turn around. 75 foot away, around that corner by the gutter. Is that okay? And he said, no. They want one on each structure. So even if you have a shed that you're running power to it, you may have to put the GFCI outside first because that's technically a disconnect for 20 amps at 120 volt if you're just using it for a chicken coop, for example. If you're doing 240 volt, you could do a simple AC disconnect outside. Um, but this right here, because of the structure, and this is a livable space upstairs, I'll show you this. So we wired this. Um, keep in mind one other thing is there's a building code that says anything more than two steps, you have to have a light to service it as well as that man door. But we do have a three-way switch, and a three-way is simply described as if I hit this switch off or on, these lights will turn off or on as I go upstairs. And we gave them a second light up here so that these turn on together. As you enter into here, your three-way is going to be on and off here for that porch light as well. We're going to have our ceiling fan and then our three-way on our can lighting to get to that side. So go ahead and do a quick panoramic on this. So as you can see, this studio apartment is about 480 square foot. It is super small. Just go ahead and stay back there so I can point out. Um, so anyway, so the can lights that we're putting in are going to be all LED. And the code states that as you walk in for a building code that you have to turn something on. Whether it's a switched outlet or a can light or pendant or lighting fixture. There's a lot of things in Colorado I've noticed, especially back in the 80s and 90s, they did switched outlets. If you didn't pay for an upgrade, they had a ceiling fan or some can lighting. So we did do a three-way from here to here. So if the customer goes, you know, the, the, excuse me, the owner or whoever, the tenant goes to sleep over here in this bed area, they can just turn off these can lights. Um, the other thing is that we wired this as a, as a kitchen in here. So as you come around, these are just meaning our kitchen outlet, our gas elect, our, our gas range, and then our kitchen outlets here as well. And then over to here, they're just going to put up a uh, kind of a furniture divider right here for the bed. We did put in base heating. So our electric base heating, we separated it a little bit though. We're in the bathroom here. This is going to be the tub, the toilet, the sink. This is going to be a unistat for a three-foot baseboard heater right here, okay? Power then comes over to here, and we're going to have a, un a, a, a wall stat right here that's going to control the temperature of this side. We divided that up on purpose so as if the door opens over here, and then this thermostat kicks on because it feels the breeze when it's, you know, January, February, whatever, we don't need that side of the room kicking on and wasting energy or just making it really super warm. So we divided that to that thermostat right there. We'll do this baseboard heater right here. This is going to be another three-footer and another baseboard heater here at eight feet. Keep in mind that you still have to meet code within the break of a wall. So this is a closet. So my new break is here at six foot. You cannot be further than six, but less than one foot, 20 inches, whatever. Right here, we still have to meet that we don't put a plug above the baseboard heaters. They do make baseboard heaters where you can get the plug built in on each side if there's gonna be an issue, but we still maintain our six foot space and then not further than 12. At the end of this baseboard heater, we still have a plug at this corner so we can meet that 12 foot rule. Then as coming around, we just meet that same rule um, for 12 foot thereafter. Um, in a nutshell, we ran a panel up to here. The customer um, preferred it to be all downstairs. I talked him into it, but it's better to have this panel up here for two reasons. One, let's say the owner has a panel in the garage down below and the tenant didn't rent that area and they have a breaker trip and they're out of town. They can't reset it, especially if it's an arc fault that tripped on a treadmill. Um, that can make it a big nuisance if the owner left for a while. The other thing is that um, to run all of these circuits, which in this panel right here, we've got 12 circuits. So we're gonna run all of these circuits all the way downstairs through the wood. Uh, that would have made it really difficult in the garage. Better to bring up just a quick sub feed number two aluminum set, 100 amp panel, breaker it downstairs, 
You don't have to have a breaker up here. It's a main lug. The breaker is down there being serviced with that tie tag that I showed you. Um, so the odd thing about this is that he's actually in 2015 right now, or excuse me, it's 2016. He actually had his permit freeze back in 13. So he's been working on this house for two years extending it. So they allowed him to wire on the 2011 to 2014 code, which basically means that I don't have to have arc bolts everywhere. Otherwise, if I did, I'd have to have them um, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, uh, the refrigerator. Uh, I'd have to have a dual action breaker there for the GFCI because it's more than six foot, the tankless water heater up here. So I would have literally had about five, six more dual action breakers, which would have cost me, my cost about another $400 just for the breakers to be that dual action. Otherwise, I can just pop in a simple $10 breaker and I'm done. Um, so we only have two arc fault protections in here at this point for that. We have our baseboard heaters right here. This panel is not allowed to be in a bathroom. It can be in a closet, or excuse me, it can be in a utility closet, which does not have linen or clothes, but that's assuming there's a good amount of space. So for instance, if there's a furnace there, a washer or dryer, you should be okay. But you cannot have things pushed up against that like a permanent washer or dryer. You should have that to this side. Um, you cannot have this in the landing of a stairway. And because this is not R3 rated, this panel itself by this design cannot be outside. And the one that's outside shouldn't be inside that you already saw the difference of. So um, the other thing I wanted to show you is that this simple little area, when we bid it, trying to explain that to the customer, this is 12 circuits just upstairs, okay? Then we have our two circuits feeding the garage at 125 amps, and then downstairs we have two circuits in that panel doing the garage, and then we have two circuits at the 100 amp feeding to this panel here. So we have a total of 18 circuits just for this little garage and building. Um, here's the thing that you can look at for trying to figure out how much baseboard heating. Each foot for your baseboard heating is going to be 225 watt, or yeah, excuse me, 225 watts. So if we have 225 watts, and in here right now we have equivalent to, let's see, it's um, I think we did that at 311 six and nine we have about 20 feet so at 20 foot at 250 watts and you do the math that is going to basically almost give us 5,000 kilowatts in this upstairs area now the customer said that his um, general contractor said that the rule of thumb if it's insulated well the windows and the doors and the insulation which by the way this all has two by six walls up here and two by four walls downstairs which is code and they allow extra batting inside of here so he said i could get away with six watts per square foot so let's assume this place is five hundred square foot and we have five thousand watts at 250 watts times 20 feet Okay, it might be more like 4,450, but just these round numbers. We have 5,000 watts upstairs based on how many feet at 250 watts. This is 500 square foot and we divide that out. We're going to get an average of 10 watts per square foot, which is really high. But keep in mind, we also broke up our thermostats from different locations because that's our coldest point versus over here. You have to purposely open these windows in order to get these to kick on versus the door where it just kicks in because someone came home. Anyways, guys, um, the video is getting a little long. I appreciate your time. I hope this was helpful for you to see that when people call me up and say, hey, I've got a real simple project, it looks fairly easy, and um, it shouldn't take a lot but a couple outlets. It's never that way. So when you call me up and you're saying simple, easy, um, no problem, blah, 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 usually I don't think you're seeing the dollar signs. Bottom line, this is a studio apartment. It has to be treated with uh, power, light, and heat, and AC. It also has to be treated as well as a cooking area. And as soon as you call it a kitchen and a cooking, you're getting in a lot more codes. Um, 210.52 and 210.50 are some of those areas that you guys can Google and look up. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.